Everyone. Quick, 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 quick. Hello everyone, here we go. Week two. We're just about to finish week two, it's a milestone. Well done for making it so far. Who's done the prac exam? Okay, that's really good. Who, who still has a prac exam ahead of them? Okay, excellent. If you guys that have already done the prac exam had a piece of advice for those that have yet to do it, what would it be? What's that? Tell them everything. Tell them everything. <laughs> Tell them everything. Uh, what would your piece of advice be? Learn how to do linked lists. Learn how to do linked lists. That's probably the best advice you could have given. Yeah, you certainly need to know about pointers and linked lists because... Shh, 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 shh. Who does know about pointers and linked lists? No one. <laughs> Who's completely forgotten everything they learned in the previous course? Excellent. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so the prac exam's there to sort of tell you what we expect you to know. So it's absolutely fine. Shh, 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 shh. It's absolutely fine if you don't pass the prac exam. But it's not absolutely fine if in a week or two's time you would still fail it. And certainly by the end of the course, if you still haven't learnt the stuff that we expected you to know at the start of the course, you know, that, that's actually a very serious problem. So just regard it as an alert. We don't directly use any of that stuff for another week or two. So you've still got a week or two to catch up on anything you're behind on. Don't forget also, if you're um, a repeating student and are really keen not to fail this time, repeating because you failed previously, and are, and are keen not to fail this time, remember to apply by sending an email to CS1927. Apply to go to David's tutorial on Friday which is designed for repeating students, and he has uh, the challenge to make sure that no one in that tutorial fails. And he's taking that quite seriously. Uh, but that will require extra work from you, but if you really want to pass the course, that's the tutor to be in. And if you fail the prac exam and are freaked out completely and think there's a whole lot of stuff you don't know that you should know and somehow you didn't learn it in the previous course, then what you could do is also mail CS1927 and beg to get into that tutor too. And if there's any spaces, we'll take a few extra people and slip them into that tutor. Um, but your normal tutor will also be able to help you because your normal tutors are fantastic and really nice. And most of you have met your tutors by now and hopefully realise how simultaneously very smart and very nice they all are. In fact, I can see some of them sitting in the room right now. So that's very good. Just watching what you're doing. Okay, let's, let's get into the lecture. Sorting. Lecture slides. This is the last week you won't need to log in to view the lecture slides. As of next week, everything you need to log in. So make sure you do get your login set up in your lab this week, your wiki login. Okay, let's go. So that's what we did yesterday. Here's what we're doing today. Let's make it big. Okay. So yesterday, um, we did an interesting thing. We, we've looked at our three quadratic sorting algorithms, the standard ones that everyone knows that we just use by default when we have to do sorting ourselves. Well, two of them are, and one bubble sort's just the standard one that everyone learns for the first algorithm they ever learned sort for some reason, even though it's terrible. Um, so we know those three algorithms, and we've made fun of them a lot. And what we did yesterday was we looked at them and thought, well, okay, let's analyze them and find the problems with them, and then work out in some sort of systematic way if there are ideas in there that are good that we can use to improve them. Maybe by finding out what their weaknesses are, we can strengthen them. And we looked at insertion sort and we came up with two improved versions of insertion sort by studying two different aspects that were slowing insertion sort down. And then we um, generalized the whole idea of insertion sort and came up with merge sort. Now you haven't yet seen an implementation of merge sort, though I've sketched the algorithm out. You haven't seen it coded up. And similarly, we haven't worked out the complexity. We gave an expression that the complexity of it must satisfy, but we realized that we didn't know how to solve that equation. And we will solve it today. So that's what we were up to yesterday. So we took the idea of insertion sort and we played with it and we got some good sorts out of it. And why did we start with insertion sort? Because of the three sorts that looked the most promising. What neat property did it have that the other two, bubble sort and selection sort, didn't have? If it's already sorted, it's quick. Yeah, it has the potential to run in linear time. And that's fantastic. That's what we regard as a very good algorithm. So. 
it has this sort of really good upside, but in the, that's only in the best case. In the worst case, it's n squared, and in the average case, it'll turn out to be in the n squared too. That way, not so interested in average cases. Okay, so today let's look at bubble sort and see if we can do the same thing. Now we always make fun of bubble sort because it's weak, but easy to implement and easy to get correct. So it does have that nice property. Do you remember when we were analyzing bubble sort, we did, came up with an expression to compute how many cycles it would take to execute a bubble sort program on a fictional chip that we postulated. Sometimes it ran faster than other times. What was the difference between it running fast and running slower? I mean, <laughs> what's the difference between it running slow and running slightly slower? <laughs> what was it that was changing? You were here the other day. I recognize your faces. Is someone turning on a Windows machine? <laughs> um, what was it that slowed down bubble sort? It wasn't completely oblivious. It didn't always run at the same speed. There was something in the input data that would cause it sometimes to speed up or slow down. What was it? If it's already almost sorted, if it's already almost sorted what didn't it have to do? Sort. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's an oblivious sort. It still tries to sort even when everything's sorted. But there's one thing it doesn't do. Swap. The number of swaps were reduced. So let's look at swaps in bubble sort. Okay. When do we swap things? Well, if you remember bubble sort, it compares adjacent adju elements and swaps them when they're out of sequence. Let me write a sequence on the board. And let's just, um, the general approach, let me say what I'm trying to do is, we're not just going to jump around and pick an algorithm and then talk about it and then move on and jump around and pick another algorithm and talk about it. And be, okay, that's like a menagerie approach to algorithms. And hopefully when you're programming, after you become algorists, you're not going to write your programs by as soon as you hear a problem, thinking, oh, I know an algorithm that solves that problem in some fashion or other, and instantly applying it. Hopefully you're going to be, uh, adopt this sort of scientific approach, the method of a scientist, and be systematic and reflective. And given a problem, you're going to think very carefully about that specific problem and the sorts of instances of the problem you're likely to encounter, and you will make a wise decision about which algorithm to pick. So we're going to do the same thing here. We're sort of going to be reflective. We're going to look at bubble sort and we're going to think, hmm, can we learn something from bubble sort? Bubble sort is almost like a failed experiment. It's like, it's like having mold on your Petri dishes. But maybe instead of throwing the Petri dishes out, we can look at the failed experiment and learn something neat. So here's some numbers. One, two, three, four, five, seven, Six, eight, nine. When's bubble sort going to, how many swaps is bubble sort going to do in sorting this? It's only going to have to do one. These two. What's the problem with these two? They're sort of in the wrong order. What if I did this? One, two, well, they are in the wrong order. It's <laughs> sort of a bad What if we did this? One, two, five. Three, four, seven, six, eight, nine. How many swaps is bubble sort going to have to do now? Seven, three, three, five, three, oh, okay, there's lots of thinking. I like this, it's good. Hopefully everyone's thinking, if you're just sitting there, this is a clue, this is like a litmus test for how well you're going at uni. If you're just sitting there thinking, Mm hmm, hurry up and tell us the answer. <laughs> That's not good. You've got to think, take a good hard look at yourself and think, why am I at uni? What do I want to get out of uni? Hmm, is he finished yet? You've got to ask yourself questions like that. Because basically if you engage with the work, yeah, 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 your brain uh, switches on and learns it much, much better. Yes. Three. Okay, who else thinks three? All right, who thinks four? Four. Who thinks four? Yes, who thinks more than four? How many do you think? You're not going to say? Okay. <laughs> I like your approach. Uh, who thinks less than three? I'll tell you one way we could work it out. We could count the number of elements that pairwise are the wrong way around. Uh, these two are okay. 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 
these two are okay is an Australian expression, <laughs> meaning, <laughs> okay. These two are wrong. These two are wrong. These two are wrong. No, they're not. No, they're not. They're right. These two are okay. These two are okay. These two are okay. Uh, these two are okay. These two are okay. 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 Hang on. Uh, okay. Okay. Wrong. wrong. There are three invert. We call that an inversion in the data. There are three inversions in that data. If you look at what a bubble sort does as it operates, every time it swaps, it undoes precisely one inversion. So that's a quick way. So let me give you another puzzle now. One, two, three, four, five, seven, zero. Quickly, just tell me, how many swaps is bubble sort going to have to do? Six? Oh, you guys are quick. Shh, let's see. Wrong, 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 wrong. This is what they tell us in teacher school never to say. <laughs> wrong, wrong. Everything else is okay. How many was that? One, two, three, four, five, six. Well done, guys. Okay, cool. All right, that's really good. So the number of inversions, do you remember what an inversion is? Do I have to give a formal definition? An, invo an inversion is defined as not these two are okay. This has uh, six inversions, so bubble sort's going to take six swaps to get rid of it. What's the most inversions I could possibly ever have in n items? n minus one, close. n minus one. Plus, the first one could be wrong with everyone else. Then the next one could be wrong with everyone else. You've not seen this expression before. What's the value? N outside of N plus 1. Is that right? Oh. Is it N plus 1 or N minus 1? You sure? You're not tricking me. There's... I'm just going to believe you. Yeah, it's confusing me too because it's like the first and the last. Oh, hang on, that's n minus one <laughs> times the number of elements of what I. Yeah, it is n minus one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I told you it was n minus one. Okay. So this here, that's what a mathematician would call it. But what do we call this? <laughs> n squared. It's wonderful. Don't do this in math test, but in computing we just say n squared. So there's order n squared. Oh, we have to put the big O in front. Oh, it's n squared. If there's n squared inversions in the worst case, and each time bubble sort runs, it undoes one, each time it does a swap, it undoes one inversion, or each time there's one inversion, it does one swap, what's the worst case number of swaps that bubble sort's going to have to do? n squared. It's got to be an n squared algorithm. We can't escape it because there's n squared inversions. If you look at insertion sort, if you look at selection sort, every comparison they do, they undo at most one inversion. So these guys are doomed, in the worst case, to be n squared. Can we break the n squared limit? Can we get better than n squared? Bubble sort is bad, but it's going to give us the keys to breaking the n squared barrier. Because we've seen, in order to break the n squared barrier, what is our sort algorithm going to have to do? For each comparison or for each swap, suppose it's a swap based one, what's it going to have to do? It's going to have to undo more than one inversion. Now, how can you undo more than one inversion? I suppose I'm going to swap two elements in this list. How am I going to undo more than one inversion? Or, or what is it about bubble sort that means it only fixes one inversion each time? What's the problem? It swaps adjacent elements. This is the clue. If we're only ever going to be swapping or comparing adjacent elements, we're doomed to be n squared. So let's be bold. Let's swap elements far apart. Do you remember what I did in the very first lecture when we had poor Jared down here with a bag over his head? <laughs> that was excellent. <laughs> and in addition, do you remember in the first lecture, when we were setting all the numbers up to be bubble sorted, 
I did one thing. While these guys were all swapping with their neighbours, I said, jumble the data up, and everyone was swapping with their neighbours. They were doing one inversion every swap. That wasn't very interesting. Remember, I just did one thing. I picked one element, and I took it all the way up to the other end of the list. It's like doing six, creating six or seven or eight or nine inversions with one move. And it turned out that was going to be the limiting thing for the runtime of um, bubble sort, even with a quick exit. So we're going to have to come up with a, a, a sort of an algorithm that swaps, if we're going to be doing a swapping based sort algorithm, is swapping adjacent elements is never going to give us any joy. We've got to swap elements far away from each other. And a very clever guy, an amazingly clever guy, called Donald Shell. And in fact, my second daughter's middle name is Donald Shell. <laughs> but I've never told anyone that, including the government. And back in the late 50s or early 60s, a very clever guy came up with a sort that he called shell sort. And here's how it goes. It's just like bubble sort, except instead of comparing elements with adjacent elements, you compare them with elements a long way away. And the, the, the long way awayness, the, the how far away they are, is called like the, uh, let's say that's the gap. So if you're going to shell sort with a gap of three, uh, let me get some random data here. Let me just jumble this up a bit more. Uh, uh, some, you guys just call out numbers. Two, six, nine, five. That's your pin number, isn't it? I tricked you. Pi, my eye, I. Triangle, sausage. <laughs> Eight, seven. Okay. Okay, we're going to swap these numbers using shell sort. And we're going to have an interval of three. Here's how it goes. You say every third, if they're a third apart, three apart, we just regard them as being the same, in the same group. So these guys are in this group. These guys are in this group. And these guys are in this group. And what we're going to do is we're just going to consider one group at a time, and we're going to sort that group. So this is another one of these sort algorithms that requires you to use a sort algorithm in the middle of it. And the sort algorithm we, we normally use is insertion sort, because insertion sort has lots of good things going for it. The bad thing it's got going for it is n squared, but notice here we've reduced n by 3, so that's reducing n squared by 9. So that, that's pretty cool. Um, so let's run the first one. I'm going to do insertion sort on this, this, and this. What do I need to do? Oh, well, I don't even worry. What, I'm doing arbitrary sort on this, this, and this. What do I need to do to sort them? I need to interchange five and four. And then I'm going to sort. Oh, and how many versions did this fix, that one swap? One? Oh, I expect you'd be able to work this out. And I'm just thinking what a great lab question is, so we don't have to do it now. So this is, this is a lab question. I hope, and you have to remember exactly the numbers we've used. There's only one. There's only one inversion? No, it can't be. Well, it fixed three inversions, but it made two more. It fixed three, but made two more? Yeah. Oh, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, don't, let's not worry about that. <laughs> no, let's not worry. Let's just focus on the fix three part. Okay. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to do the um, six, uh, eight, three. How are we going to sort that? Well, it's going to be... 3 and the 6 are interchanged. And then we're going to do this group at the top, the 9, 1, and 7. Oh, that's a big change. We've got to do the 1 to here, the 7 to here, and the 9 to there. OK, now we've three sorted that list. It's not sorted, is it? It's better than before. But it's better than before. What's probably happened now is the number of inversions overall has reduced drastically. How many inversions were there before? How many inversions are there now? These are good questions. <laughs> now, I'm going to do something that's going to seem like magic. Or should I just tell you? I just tell, uh, let's have a vote. Let's, let's have a vote. Who thinks I should show you something now that's going to look like magic, but it's going to take a minute or two of fooling around? Oh, yeah. I said the word magic. Uh, instead of magic, I should have said hard work. Who thinks I should show you something now that's going to be really hard work? <laughs> okay. All right, let's do it. So let's now sort them with an interval of two. So this one goes with this one. I'm going to rub those out.
This one goes with this one, goes with this one, goes with this one. I like your attitude, by the way, guys. You're up for it. That's really good. Well done. Uh, we should see it, rather than me just talking about it. That was a good call. So we've divided them. We're now going to two-sort them. All right, let's not worry about what algorithm we use to two-sort. Let's imagine I'm executing insertion sort, but we, being super powerful, intelligent beat creatures, can jump straight to the right answer, which is what? Call them out. One, two, five, six, nine. And these ones here? Already sorted. OK. It's still not sorted, is it? Yeah, it's, it's got a small number of versions left, but it's still not sorted. But here's the magical thing. I three-sorted it, which is a crazy idea in itself, and it seemed to jumble things up a lot. Now, then I two-sorted it, and that seemed to jumble them up even more. Lo and behold, let's go back to our three, partitioning it into groups of three again. And let's just have a look. One, which is this one, four. Six. Sorted? Yeah. Three, five, eight. Sorted? Yeah. Two, seven, nine. Sorted. This is no coincidence. It's, it's no magic chalk. <laughs> it always turns out like that. If you k-sort a list and then you j-sort the list, it's still k-sorted. How can that be? How can, does that just seem bizarre to you? It seems bizarre to me. There's a proof. It's a long proof, but it works. But it just always works. So if you, you've got a million numbers, if you 17 sort them, and then you 35 sort them, even though the 35 is interfering with what you just did with the 17, they'll still be 17 sorted at the end. So in a sense, there's no going back. Every time you K sort it with a different value of K, you're just getting better or standing still. Yeah. Did Donald Sheldon know that? Donald Sheldon knew that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. This is the brilliance of the idea. So here's how you, in, here's how you shell sort some numbers. You get your list of numbers. I don't know. Maybe it's a million numbers we want to shell sort. And we pick some values of k. Maybe we say, oh, 30, uh, 15, 6, 4, 3, 2, 1. So I'm going to 30 sort it, then 15 sort it, then 6 sort it, then 4 sort it, then 3 sort it. Oh, it sounds like a lot of work, but if you add it up, it's still heaps less work than we used to do with the n squared thing. At the end here, it's pretty sorted. And you know what I'm going to do at the very end? I'm going to one sort it. <laughs> now, you might be thinking, hang on. If you're going to do all this other stuff and at the end just one sort it, isn't one sorting it just sorting it? So you can do whatever you want up front, because at the end, you're actually just going to sort it, aren't you? But the trick is, what algorithm am I going to use at the very end? No, what? No, no. There is no question to which the answer is bubble sort. <laughs> but remember, these guys have very nearly sorted it. By the time we get up to here, most of the inversions have gone. We're going to use insertion sort. Yes, that's right. So as long as for each of the intermediate sorts here, or at least for the last few, we use insertion sort, then this thing runs like lightning. Analyzing it is extremely hard. In fact, it's not been properly analyzed yet. Um, the first and most profound analysis done on it after, um, after Shell himself came up with it and Nuth talked about it a little bit was done by one of Nuth's students, a very cl a brilliant, in fact, mathematician and computer scientist called Vaughan Pratt, who went to Sydney University here in Australia. Uh, he was one of the founders of Sun. He's presumably fabulously wealthy. He's fabulously brilliant. He's at Stanford. He's, one, he's just amazing. He's invented a million things. His name's on lots of algorithms. Has anyone heard of any algorithms containing the word Pratt? Yep, Nuth Morris Pratt. Yep, there's heaps. He's, no, I mean, you'll see them as you go through. Um, he did his PhD. He did his master's, actually, under Jan Hext, another brilliant Australian computer scientist who was my teacher for a while. Like, I'm two steps removed from Vaughan Pratt. Um, and he, um, he did his master's thesis, no, he did his uh, on PhD thesis under Nuth, and uh, he did it on shell sorting, and he came up with some great results. He proved, uh, he came up with optimal sequences you can use for K that give this um, better than n squared performance, that actually give this n log n performance. Um, 
Uh, he produced all sorts of interesting mathematical results about it. But strangely enough, even in spite of all the brilliant work he did, and I think even Sedgwick did a bit of work later on after that. Sedgwick, the guy that wrote the textbook that we're using for this course. She also it's a very neglected sort. Not many people look at it. In fact, I was tossing up as to whether to even tell it to you. I, I love it. It's a beautiful sort, but it's a crazy sort. These days, no one fool, fools around with it much because it's very hard to understand. So we know certain intervals work really well. The theoretical intervals, intervals that Pratt used to get um, really amazing speed, in practice don't work so well because the constants are so large. He has a ridiculous number of, he has to do a ridiculous number of passes. So while it's n, n, well, I'll tell you what the complexity he gets is. He gets n log n rather than n squared. n times log of n rather than n times n itself. But even though it's n log n, there's a big k out the front of that. It's a fairly big constant. So you'd have to be sorting quite a lot of numbers till you actually got the benefit of the n log n. Um, so yeah, so we know some good intervals to use. We know bad intervals to use. And we still don't even know what the optimal intervals really are. There's still lots of open questions. So if you ever wanted to fool around and do some original research on your own that no one else seems to be interested in doing at the moment, especially if you had some sort of parallel computer or something neat like that to fool around with, as an undergrad student, you could do worse than fooling around with shell sort and trying to get some neat new results for it. So that shell sort, very beautiful. Can I tell you a funny story about shell sort? <laughs> yes, please. Uh, it's only funny to you because you're not the students involved. Um, it's about the main principle of shell sort. All the things I've said about shell sort, we've maybe talked about it for five minutes, maybe a bit longer. What's the most important or interesting result that I told you about shell sort? The most important thing to know, really, to be able to use it and understand it. That it, does, that it works, yeah. But. Ah, uh, uh, yes, yes, yeah. Once you've K sorted it, no matter what you do after that, it remains k-sorted. Yes, that is exactly right. That's the key result. You have to remember that. I set an exam where I said to students, here are some numbers. And I wrote out some numbers. And then I shall, shall sort them with the intervals um, 5, 9, 18, uh, uh, oh, 5, 9, 17, 31, uh, 16, 25, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, 4, four uh, 12, 13. I gave a ridiculous number of intervals to use. Uh, and then I said, and uh, last I said 3. And I, and I said, how many exchanges occur on the last pass? I'll ask you the question. Sort them with 5, 9, 17. Uh, oh, sorry, I've got that wrong. <laughs> Maybe drawing your attention to the pertinent fact here. Um, five, three, da, 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 nine was the last one. How many exchanges occur on the last pass? Zero. Why zero? Because it's already three sorted. It will remain three sorted from then on. If it's three sorted, it's certainly nine sorted, because nine sorted looks at a subset of the three sorted ones. Yeah? Three sorted is divided into three groups. Nine sorted divides each of those groups further. But if those groups are sorted, you're in. And so, none on 12 or 25. And there's, yeah, there's some other non-zero ones there. That's right. So the idea was I was trying to test their ability to detect that fact without actually explicitly asking that fact. And then I showed this to my head tutor at the time and said, look at this. Isn't this a great exam question? And tutor said, are oh, they going to be stressed? They're not going to remember that result. They're actually going to do it and tell you the number. And I said, no, they can't do it. It would take too long. I've given them like a million intervals and 50 numbers. And he said, they're going to do it. And I said, all right, I'll stop them doing it. And I put another 50 numbers in. <laughs> so they had 100 numbers and 100 intervals. And then I spent the day walking around the exam just getting increasingly depressed as I was walking around the exam room, as everyone was there madly shell sorting. And uh, yeah, OK. So that was, that was a sad story. It's not a funny story now I think about it. It was very sad. OK. So let's go back to the lecture. So we learned from bubble sort. This idea of inversions, also inversions apply to insertion sort and selection sort, the inversion limit. Shh, shh, shh. Limit number one is how can we break the n squared barrier, the inversion barrier, and the challenge was can we do it? And the funky sort, two funky men, uh, Vaughan Pratt and Donald Luth. And uh, oh yeah, then I wanted to talk about n squared in real life. So I, I don't want you to get the feeling that this complexity thing is this dry academic subject that doesn't occur anywhere else except in algorithms lectures. It occurs everywhere. Algorithms, 
occur all around us in everyday life, even though we don't call them algorithms. And situations have algorithmic complexity, even though we don't notice it. And we encounter this complexity all the time in everyday life. So I thought I'd give you some examples of it. Um, so, oh, okay, here's my first one, in adventure. Here's where it happens in adventure. Go down to here. Oh, you can't see that page. It's actually exactly the same set of notes. We're looking, but it has a link there that I didn't want you to click on while I was talking before. Shh, 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 don't tell anyone my password. I was horrified to, that you knew it already, whoever was calling it out before. Um, never for this sign. Let's check we got audio. Okay, lights. Is everyone ready? Here we go. Shh. Your challenge is where's the complexity in this? Okay, it was there. Did everyone see it? They were brute. It looked to me like they were brute forcing those phone numbers. Is that what you reckon? It appeared out of order. Yeah, so there was some odd thing going on. <laughs> the interesting thing to notice, and I'm sure this wasn't a computer person. They had a lot of authentic computer stuff in here. The interesting thing to notice is the digits came up. Sure, they're out of order, but the digits came up with constant speed. Yeah? Deep, 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 deep. Except for the last one took a little bit too long and I had to zoom in a little bit. They needed to zoom in for the last one for a reason that we'll see in a sec. <laughs> if they were brute forcing the number, well, let's look at the difference between digits. How much longer does it take to brute force a six-digit number than a seven-digit number? Ten times. And an eight-digit number, then a seven-digit, uh, then an eight, seven-digit number, <laughs> ten times. And a nine-digit number, then an eight-digit number, ten times. So if we're really brute forcing it, the digits should have gone and slowed down by a factor of ten. Unless they were solving each digit independently. But if they're solving each digit independently, then they all should have appeared at the same time on average, rather than equally spaced. To make this really clear, if you don't sort of get what I'm trying to get at, it's not really clear exactly what method they're using, so perhaps I'm straining at a gnat. Let's look at this last digit that they really can't show us. Why can't they show us the last digit? Because it would look ridic ridiculous, them going through about a thousand combinations to work out the last digit when they've got all the other ones. <laughs> no matter what we know about complexity, we do know when you've only got ten digits left to get one digit left, you've only got to try ten combinations. So they actually have to zoom in so we can't see the permuted down the bottom triangle the combinations. Because, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm straining at a gnat. It certainly sport the whole movie for me. What a, <laughs> what a terrible movie. Uh, similarly, it happens in the Thomas Crown Affair. Has anyone seen the Thomas Crown Affair? They grumble that Thomas Crown is hard to, they're trying to crack his burglar alarm. They plug in a device that looks really like this. Uh, and they grumble that it's hard to crack because he's got a 10 digit pin. Yet they still crack nine digits. <laughs> in 90 seconds and the 10th digit in the 100th second. Does is, is, is that make sense? Does that make sense? There's not the exponential slowdown. There should be, it should take the, um, the base size increasing every time, if really they are brute forcing it independently. And if they're doing it digit by digit, they should all happen roughly at the same time. So that's my number one thing. It lets you really annoy people around you in movies if you understand about complexity. 
Yes. Um, well, the area code formed at the same speed as the rest. Do you see it was 02 something, then it was 555, and then it was something. <laughs> it was shot in Sydney, wasn't it? That's freaky. That's freaky. We should ring that number. <laughs> that's weird, because Sydney is 02, so there you go. Isn't that, that's crazy. That, that's very funny. Okay, that's... Uh, okay, all right, uh, uh, there's all sorts of funny things to say, but we won't. Let's just do some more examples. The birthday example. Or, oh, what about the greetings example? Well, let's do the birthday example first. A famous example that mathematicians like to do when teaching year 11 math students combinatorics is we go around the room and we ask everyone when their birthday is. And we stop as soon as we have two people with the same birthday. Now, in a normal class of 27 or 28 people, they're hoping that naively you would think it's very unlikely you're going to find two people with the same birthday. But actually, the odds are greater than 50% that you will find two people with the same birthday. Does that make sense? Why is that the case? Has everyone had their math teacher do that to them? No, you haven't? Oh, okay, pretend I'm your math teacher. So, okay, class, who had a good holiday? Okay, okay then, oh, I'm going to do something fun. Okay. I want, you're going to have to say, now this is unfortunately is giving away your birthday. So I want everyone to pick a birthday of their brother or sister. <laughs> Don't pick a random one because you won't pick a truly random one. Pick a birthday of someone else you know. And just say the month and the day. 24th March. 24th March. March 2nd. March 2nd. 7th of April. 7th of April. 31st December. 31st December. As soon as someone says the one you've said, can you yell out? 15th July. 15th July. 30th August. 30th August. January 20th. It's not going to work, is it? It's just There's too many days. There's too few people. We'll never get there. January 20th. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. 22nd of October. 22nd of October. 29th of February. 29th of February. <laughs> I like that one. 1st of January. 1st of January. 1980? No. <laughs> That's right. You're not DOS. <laughs> yes? <laughs> One slash, one slash, 1900. One, one, 1900. Oh, we got the first two first of Januarys, though that's because of non-random selection. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, we'll, we'll accept that as a clash, but we'll keep going. 18th of August. 18th of August. 22nd of September. 22nd of September. 2nd of January. 2nd of January. 16th of November. 16th of November. 7th of July. Oh, I'm getting worried. 7th of July. 4th of July. Ah, oh, day that Alice in Wonderland was written. Fantastic. A very famous date. 4th of July. 1st of April. 1st of April. 27th of August. Is that a ding? No, someone had 28. 21st December. 21st December. Of May. Say that. May of May. 9th of May. 9th of July. 30th of April. 6th of September. It's not working. Help me. 8th of July. 14th of February. 28th of April. 2nd of June. How many have we done? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. No, we didn't do you. 8, 9, 10, 11. <laughs> 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28. And we didn't get there. Uh, well, 30 October. So, ah, we didn't do it. Okay. So it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. It's because I wasn't holding the magic chalk. But normally what happens, well, there's about a 50% chance it's going to work. That by the time you get up near 30, well, let's, have, let's do 30. Uh, November. What's that? 10 November. 10 November. Yeah! <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so how it normally works is the odds of getting a pair of matching birthdays are surprisingly high. We're all thinking of what's the chance of, if I pick my birthday, what's the chance of a random person having the same birthday as me? What's the chance of a random person having the same birthday as me? One in 365, presumably. So you think roughly, if I go through 30 people, that's like 30 out of 365. That's got to be like... 1 in 10 chance of getting a match, yeah, yeah, of matching with me. But the chance of anyone matching with anyone is much higher. Because how many ways are there of picking two people out of 30? How many pairs of people? 30 C2, which is equal to? No. 30 C2. No. N C2 is? n times n minus 1 over 1 times 2 equals? 
I didn't want to know the number though. I wanted to know n squared. <laughs> the number of pairs, if we're looking at pairwise matches, grows as a quadratic function. It's order n squared. It's in fact that same formula we keep seeing over and over again, NC test. Does that make sense? So this sort of trick works because people's intuition is naively thinking it's a linear function, so the chance of it working is low, but actually it's a quadratic function, so the chance of it working is quite high, though it doesn't always work. <laughs> okay, so that's another example of complexity. Not a compelling one, I'm afraid to say. What about greetings? When you walk into a room, if you greet everyone already in the room, suppose it's a dinner party, how many greetings do we have going on? N squared, the first person comes in and does none, because they're the only person in the room. Second person comes in, one greeting. Next person has to greet two of us. Next person has to greet three of us. Next person has to greet four of us. You can see it's one plus two plus, it's going to be N squared. So greetings or pairings of people tends to be um, quadratic. Keys, in computer science, when we do cryptography, in the old days, we used to do cryptography by sharing passwords. So if I wanted to send a secret message to you, in advance we would agree on a shared secret, a password that we would use to encrypt our message. Okay, like bananas. bananas. <laughs> Open to dictionary attack, but let's say it's bananas. And now I want to send a message to you. Now, unfortunately, nature of the internet, nature of communication generally is it's open to eavesdropping. So as I'm sending a message to you, you could easily hear it, and I don't, it's only for us. But I also want to be able to talk securely to you, to you without you hearing. So we've got to pick another password. What password do we have to pick? Apples. <laughs> I can sense a theme. <laughs> okay. So we've got bananas and apples. Now, when you guys talk to each other, you don't want me to hear, so you've got to pick a password between you. Oranges. <laughs> okay. In general, with n people, how many passwords are we going to need? n squared. This works fine if there's a small group of spies in a spy network, but what if there's a million people on the internet all trying to buy stuff from eBay? It doesn't work. What's a million squared? 2B. Yeah, it's a big number. You don't want to have to think of a million keys and share them in advance. That's just not going to work. So the problem is the number of keys we need to have a secure crypto system scales quadratically. And as the size of the system grows, it becomes less and less manageable. And this is called the key management problem. Uh, so, in fact, a whole new branch of cryptography was sort of developed, and one of the reasons for that was to deal with the key management problem, and that's called uh, public key cryptography. And in public key cryptography, I can tell everyone what my key is, because knowing the key to talk to me, fruit. yeah, the key is fruit. I'll tell you, the key to talk to me is fruit. <laughs> it turns out you need a different key to decode the message than to encode the message. So if I tell you all the same key, for encoding, the, for sending me the message, it doesn't help you eavesdrop on anyone else's messages because that's not the key you need to decode. And that makes it linear again. It makes the problem slightly more manageable. It goes from quadratic to linear because what quadratic just wasn't working. Uh, I had another example. Um, books. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I have some awesome science fiction, hardcore science fiction books. These are E.E. E. Doc Smith. He's a doc, he's a scientist. These are brainy books. Triplanetary, Galactic Patrol. First lensman, grey lensman, second stage lensman, children of the lens. How thick are they? Guesstimate the number of pages. How good are you? 250, well done. So to read N books in the series, how much reading do I have to do? No, times pages. but I'm a computer scientist. N. It's linear. Reading this series is a linear task. I can handle linear tasks. Brilliant. Donald Knuth, three volume set, soon to be four. Every one the same thickness. Reading the books is a linear task. Patrick O'Brien writes awesome seafaring novels. I've just got the first four here. What's that? J.K. Rowling. J.K. Rowling doesn't write seafaring novels. <laughs> <laughs> see? See? So, this one's a bit fatter, but essentially linear. If we knew the number of pages, we could fit something to it. Do you agree? If we did want to talk about fantasy, Ursula Le Guin, best fantasy writer ever. Wizard of Earthsea trilogy. One, two, three. Three, the second book's even thinner. <laughs> linear? Linear. J.R. Rowling. <laughs> the Philosopher's Stone. 
J, oh, J.R. Tolkien. I get them mixed up all the time. Okay, here we go. A reasonably thin book. Not much content, but at least you don't have to spend hours reading it. She's famous now, so she doesn't have to listen to the editor so much, so the book expands a little bit. But it's only a little bit fatter. <laughs> book number three. Oh, look at that. It's looking like each book is getting a constant amount bigger than the previous one. What's that going to give us? N squared. It's going to be quadratic to read the series. That's a bit daunting. Oh, my God. What's going on? Same amount of content, many more pages. The next three books are just one book. I'm still waiting for it to finish. What do we see? Is this exponential? Remember, I complained that humans are inclined to call things exponential when they're not. We have to be careful with our choice of words. What you need to know as to whether Harry Potter is really exponential or not is the exact number of pages in each of these books, which is your lab exercise for this week. <laughs> and you'll need to fit a curve to them and work it out. If they are truly exponential, then if she decided to write another story, wow. it would possibly involve a thousand books. <laughs> and at the current rate, I was, oh, I was really excited. I was annoyed when I read this book or saw this film because I said, it didn't finish. It's just setting up for the next one. I asked you, what's the next one like? And someone said, it's the same as that one. And I thought, ha, oh, you're just joking. I went and saw it with my kids. It was. It didn't finish anything. <laughs> They're just setting it up for the next one. And I said to my daughters, how many books are there? And they said, there's just seven. And I said, so the next one, she's actually going to have to finish something. And they said, no, actually, she's breaking into two movies. <laughs> so yeah, there we go. OK. So yeah. anyway, I won't give anything away about the movie, but it's my favorite part is when is when Voldemort <laughs> says to Frodo, <laughs> I am your father. <laughs> that was the best bit. OK. All right. Oh, so there we go. Now we're going to take a little break now. And after the break, we'll return to Merge Sort, which we've left in limbo. <laughs> <laughs>